Good morning, everybody. We we're a couple of minutes late, which is fine by Indian standards. Uh, it's just a couple of minutes past ten. Uh, Lord Mixon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to all of you to this day and a half long workshop we are hosting in collaboration with the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate. The Global Commission on the Economy and Climate is a major new international initiative comprising former heads of government, finance ministers, and leaders in the field of economics, business, and finance. The Commission's flagship project, for which we have assembled here today, the New Climate Economy, brings together research institutes and economists from six continents to analyze the risks and benefits of climate action. The Commission is chaired by former Mexican President Felipe Calderon, while the Economic Advisory Panel to the Commission is chaired by Lord Nick Stern, and includes, among others, Chris Gopalakrishnan and Isha Raluvalia, who is our chairperson. Since its establishment in 1981, ICRIO's range of research has steadily expanded beyond international trade and economics. In 2010, ICRIO's board approved inclusion of environment and climate change as the seventh thrust area for research with the same overarching objective that governs all of our other research, i.e. to create knowledge for informed and evidence-based policy. Two years ago in 2010, two, sorry, two, 2012, ICRIO in collaboration with the Rockefeller Foundation launched a research effort on climate change and the economic competitiveness of cities in an attempt again to inform the policy discourse around the need to build greater public and private investment to secure the economic competitiveness of cities in the face of climate risk. A comparative analysis of four rapidly growing secondary cities, Surat, Kochi, Pune, and Ludhiana, will form the basis of the policy insights from that project. In this backdrop, and in the backdrop of several other research initiatives in ICRIA, such as fiscal prudence, urbanization, and agriculture, ICRIA gratefully and willingly agreed to collaborate with the Global Commission in this exciting inter-country synthesis and research on climate economy. As you will notice over the course of the next day and a half, there are five themes that we have chosen to do the synthesis and research work on. These include macro, we do overall macro synthesis, then there's a critical evaluation of the 12th plan from the climate perspective, then there's research on agriculture cities and energy demand management. I think to this audience, I don't need to really say this, but GDP growth in India has decelerated sharply from 8.5% in 2011 to 6.5% in 2012 and to just about a little less than 5% in 2013. But if you look at the past in the three decades since 1981, the trend growth was an impressive 6%, and in the first decade of the century, it was even higher at 7.5%. The reasons for this strong growth lie in accumulation of physical capital, labor and human capital, and productivity. But over the very long term, growth will be driven, as we know, by productivity, which will require consistent implementation of reforms and also improvement in both the institutional capacity as well as the quality. But as we know, it is not just the quality sorry, the quantity, but also the quality of growth that matters. Therefore, for concerted policy action, it is also crucial to try and understand the risks associated with growth driven by intensive resource use, such as fossil fuels-based energy. India has, as you will know, unilaterally set a goal of reducing the emissions intensity of GDP by between 20 to 25 percent by 2020, over 2005 levels. In the macro synthesis work uh, that you will see in the next session, we try and underline the risks associated with the business as usual model. 
evidence of the negative impacts of climate change are already being observed in different parts of the world, including in Asia and in India. India's recent growth experience has been resource intensive, and climate change is likely to aggravate the concerns of resource availability, to name one, water, and fossil fuels-based energy, and also the distribution of those resources. To meet the cha overarching challenges that India faces, including of poverty reduction and sustainable economic growth, therefore, policies that help mitigate these risks will help build a more resilient future. For instance, the research on cities, agriculture, and energy demand that I mentioned that we have undertaken as a part of this very exciting project that will be discussed over the next uh, day and a half, that research points in the direction of certain low regret strategies that can lower greenhouse gas emissions and at the same time generate significant co-benefits. In agriculture, it is estimated that uh, in the absence of any measures, uh, productivity could fall by about 25% at the end of the century. The opportunities lie in better livestock and water management, introduction of straw-rated efficient irrigation pumps, replacement of diesel pumps with solar pumps that could improve productivity while strengthening resilience to climate change. You will see, you will hear about all of this during the technical session on agriculture. And you will also hear in the city session that there it is estimated that 70% of urban infrastructure is yet to be built in India. The number could vary between 70 to 80%, but a very large part of Indian infrastructure is yet to be built. And therefore, better urban planning and patterns of urbanization can improve resilience to climate change and avoid the lock-in to carbon-intensive uh, infrastructure. And then you will see in the energy demand session that better management of demand through rationalizing of fuel and electricity subsidies uh, that, as we know, end up promoting very little equity ought to be seriously reviewed along with targeted cash transfer schemes. Then there is research that is coming out from the World Bank that suggests that mitigating carbon emissions can generate very large co-benefits. The World Bank estimates show that environment externalities in India cost India 5.7% of GDP, and urban pollution is an alarming cause of premature deaths. 13 of G20's 20 most polluted cities are in India. So in this background, uh, ICRA was and is very excited about its research in this vital area for policy. The research presented here over the next day and a half should be looked at as work in progress. Over the course of the next few months, we will seek to offer real policy choices from India's perspective, keeping India's interests in sharp focus. There are several policies, and I've noted a couple already, uh, that we could adopt in agriculture and energy demand for cities independently that could have substantial climate benefits while improving productivity. Over time, we promise to dig deeper in these areas to provide a better and stronger basis for more informed policy. I thank all of you for being here uh, to share your wisdom and participate in the discussions that will follow in the sessions. I especially thank the speakers and discussants, many of whom have traveled several hundred miles to be here with us today. One of them who needs absolutely no introduction, and I'm not going to, all the CVs are in the packets that you will uh, see, so I'm not going to introduce, there is no need to introduce Lord Nicholas Stern, who he is the author of the celebrated Stern Review on the Economics of Climate Change. And therefore, it's a very proud moment for us to ICREA, in ICREA to welcome him back to ICREA. He's been associated with ICREA uh, earlier as well. Please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Raja. Um, can you uh, hear me and see me? Yeah. So, with your permission, I will uh, speak from a seated position. Uh, I can actually stand up. Um, I'm not that tall, so it wouldn't make very much difference visibly. Um, but I wanted to uh, start from the beginning with a fairly relaxed uh, atmosphere in which we can uh, exchange ideas and uh, talk to each other. So I thought that might be slightly more positive from a sitting position. 
I wanted to thank you, Rajat, for the very warm welcome. Uh, I feel very close to Ikria. Um, uh, this is my uh, 40th year now coming to India. I came in 74. And in that time, I've been following one village uh, in Muradabad district of uh, UP. We're still following that village. We have a study of that village, 100% uh, of all households. We have six, one for every decade for independence, since, since uh, independence. And we're planning the one for the next decade, uh, too. And um, as we talk about these uh, planetary uh, issues, for me, that's always the place where I come back to and ask, what does all this mean for um, Palanpur? And there are many of you here uh, with whom I've discussed Palanpur over the years. Uh, in 1981, um, S.B. Gupta, um, I think perhaps the first e executive director? Second. Second, after K. B. Lal, yeah. Came to um, ISI in uh, Bangalore, where I was living at, at the time, uh, to present the perspective document on the um, uh, sixth five year plan. And we're now going for the 12th. So um, I feel the interactions with uh, DFID over the years, uh, sorry, with ICRIA over the years have been very deep. And um, I hope that they will continue that way. And I'm very confident they will continue that way. And this particular one, uh, I think the uh, commitment that ICRIA has shown uh, in terms of the work that it's already done and the work's engaged in uh, is it, very impressive. And I wanted to thank you personally, Rajat, and uh, Isha, uh, I have already thanked personally, she can't be here today, Isha Lawalia, for that uh, commitment and the great work that is being done. So it's a, a great pleasure for me to be uh, here with you. I wanted to see my remarks as framing the discussion. There's, there'll be a lot of detail on energy and uh, cities and agriculture and forestry and the overall growth and macro picture. And uh, I don't want to anticipate that. There are other people here who've done that work who are much closer to the detail than I could be. So I thought my uh, contribution could be in framing the story uh, where does the detail of the India work sit in relation to uh, the world story and to say something about the motivation and background for the uh, Calderon Commission, which, which I co-chair, and, and the, as you mentioned, the Economic Advisory Panel, which, uh, which I chair. So I'll start by doing that, and then at the end of my remarks, I'll start to introduce the India story, but only to introduce it because it's uh, be presented in much more detail by those who are really working on that detail. Now, in framing the question, let me start uh, in a um, uh, the moment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change publication of its uh, working group three. Uh, these come only seven years, every seven years or so. And working group three, the last of the working group publications was yesterday. And it was launched by my friends um, Pachi Pachari and uh, Otmar Edenhofer in Berlin yesterday. So it's, we've got a timely anchor point, as it were, for asking how does all this fit in the global story. And I want to take that story into uh, some of the numbers. But basically, from the point of view of where the world has been going in the last decade, um, the answer is not a very good place. Uh, we have had uh, half since uh, 1970, we've had half of all the emissions since 1750. So there's been an enormous acceleration in the last uh, 40 years or so. Um, but it's actually accelerated further in the last decade. Uh, emissions in the last uh, well, let's take 2000 to 2010. Those are the figures that the IPCC gives. Uh, emissions, world emissions have gone up from 40 gigatons of CO2 equivalent per annum to 50. We've seen a uh, growth rate uh, of emissions in that period, the first decade of this century, of 2.2% per 
per annum, and in the previous four decades, which were already growing much faster than previously, it was 1.3. So we have seen an acceleration in emissions growth. It's been a bad decade in many ways for emissions. Now, there's some positive things. One of the reasons it's been a bad decade for em emissions, that first decade of this century, was it was a good decade for growth. And we shouldn't be grumpy about uh, a good decade for growth because the name of the game is to um, try to combine climate responsibility with growth development and poverty reduction. But we have to begin by noting that we have not been doing that. We have had growth and good in the world as a whole, but we've also had strong growth in emissions. So we start from a very striking reminder that we've got a lot of decoupling to do uh, and we haven't been doing it very well in the last decade or so, the decoupling of the emissions from growth. This whole story is about breaking the link between production and consumption on the one hand and emissions on the other. It's not about stopping growth. It would be daft to try to do that, but it also would be uh, in many ways inequitable uh, to do that. Um, but we have to begin by recognizing that we start in a difficult place and we haven't been doing very well. And we've seen over this last decade an increase in the um, carbon content of um, fossil fuel energy. In other words, in contrast